Welcome to the EOL seminar series, and I'm, I get the great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Ya Chen Fang, who is visiting us from McGill University. Ya Chen um, is from Taiwan originally. She received her bachelor's and master's degree in atmospheric sciences from the National Central University in Taiwan, working with Tai Chi on her um, master's work. And um, a lot of us here in the SPL group met Ya Chen when she was a student working on the Timrex project with us in, in Taiwan when we had SPL down there. So she's visited NCAR a couple of times. This is her first time to give a seminar for us, though. And she's going to talk to us about her PhD research work that she's been doing with Frederick Fabry on improving the radar refractivity retrieval. Um, thanks for coming, and thanks, Yoel, for having me here. Uh, it's my pleasure to here to present the work on the refractivity since it was t 20 years ago developed in NCAR by my supervisor, Fabry Frederick. So in the beginning, I want to acknowledge some people who helped this work. It's the, my supervisor, uh, Fabry, and the radar group. And also help comes from the NCAR, from Tammy, uh, Mike Dixon, and well, uh, Dr. Wolf from NOAA and some people from Imarin Canada. So there are three parts of today's talk. The first will be the introductions, like what's the development in refractivity from 1997 until now. And the second part will be many of my um, progress in my PhD, and it will be the more technical part. The third part is the future application based on current the data we have and what's possibility in the future using the refractivity field. So people here are very familiar with the refractivity field. A refractivity field is a function of pressure, temperature, and water vapor pressure. So here is how the refractivity values um, varies with the different temperature and the different uh, dew point temperature and humidity here. So for example, when the temperature is 20 degrees C, the refractivity will range from um, 275 to 375. And when the temperature goes higher, you will have a, a wider range of the refractivity, which will show us more information on the moisture variation. For example, if the temperature is uh, 80 Celsius degree, uh, degree C, one degree changes in temperature will cause one end unit changes. But only for dew point, temperature only requires 0.2 degrees C and you will have the same amount of change. So it's very sensitive to the moisture variation. Here's the example using the surface station. So this is a time series of the uh, Montreal uh, YUL service stations in summertime. The black line is the temperature and the blue line is the dew temperature. So you can see the diurnal cycle here in the temperature. And this plot is the refractivity field in the time series calculated from the surface observation. Basically, you, it's very uh, clear. You can see the refractivity variation is very related to the uh, dew point uh, temperature variation. So we can sort of estimate the re uh, moisture information from the refractivity. And among the surface stations, like 74% of the refractivity change is due to the uh, moisture variation. And 25% of the changes of refractivity probably due to the temperature. So moisture still play a very important role in the refractivity variation. How does the radar estimate the refractivity? The basic idea is that the speed of the uh, radar wave or any kind of light in the air, will, the speed of this light will depend on the refractivity change of the air. And we know the temperature and water vapor changes. So as this variable changes, the end changes. So that's the, the speed of the radar wave. Therefore, the time of the radar wave transfers from the radar to the ground targets will uh, changes depend on end variations. But radar doesn't measure any time information. But we can measure another information, which is the phase. So bas basically, um, measuring the phase of a given ground targets at 
the known distance. Then we will uh, measure the uh, temporal variation of the phase. You will get the information of the average change of the refractivity. And we know the refractivity is very sensitive to the moisture variation. Therefore, you will get a proxy of the moisture from the, the phase data in the refractivity estimation. So how do we get a 2D map from the very simple uh, concept? Uh, previous, we, uh, we know we need to know where is the ground target, because the ground target has the fixed uh, range. So all the phases changes due to the refractivity change. Here's the example of the uh, ground target map from McGill radar. The center is the radar, and the, the radius is 48 uh, kilometer. So the higher, uh, the more darker color here shows the, where is the location of the ground targets. So like this more uh, the darker one is the urban area. So you got good ground targets. And also some, like the, this thin line is the power pole. So they are also a ground target, good ground targets too, because they don't move. So their face is more representativeness of the refractivity change. Then we know, we measure the temporal phase difference from this ground targets. The temporal phase difference, the phase difference between two time. And we know this will measure, records the refractivity change by uh, the phase difference changes. And then we, how do we get the refractivity map? The thing is, uh, the local refractivity change will depend on the radial gradient of the phase change. In this way, we can measure the local N and plus the, the reference end, then we will get a map. So this is a map of the refractivity, which gives you the 2D thermodynamic uh, information near surface. And the refractivity map is you a, a high temporal and a spatial resolution, because the temporal resolution depend, depends on your scanning strategy. So mostly it's like five to 15 minutes depends on the scan strategy and the, the special resolution is four by four kilometers. Um, here's an example of using the refractivity. This is a, a dry line case so, case, so the left panel is the reflectivity field and this is the thin line of the reflectivity which is the return from the insects and it will show the low level convergence Usually people, now caster will use that for the low level convergence and to detect some boundaries, but it is more a kin kinematic way. And the right hand side is the, the refractivity we measure from the radar. The more reddish color means the high refractivity, which means the mo more moist part. And the green part is the lower refractivity, which means the dry. So here you will see a very clear uh, contrast between the moist air and the dry air to show this boundary. Furthermore, you can see the refractivity uh, boundary is more interesting because it shows some, um, some signatures you cannot find on the uh, reflectivity. And you, the moisture variation is really quite um, variable. And this this work has been done in the, the IHOP, uh, IHOP experiment. In this experiment, there are a lot of pioneer work has been done to uh, detect the low level boundaries associated uh, storm flow or the dry lines. Here's another case, use the refractivity to show the boundary layer processes. The, this panel is the daily rainfall of the, in the previous day. And this three panel shows the, the, more, the refractivity evolutions in the morning. And in the morning, the, air condi the weather condition is more calm and less windy. So almost the, all the refractivity change will comes from the surface. So around the noon, after some ev more evaporation occurred, you will see the very similar pattern of the refractivity shows the high moisture compared with the uh, the rainfall pattern in the previous day. And in that period, uh, because for easily use, people tried also to invert the refractivity to the dew point temperature. 
and co even consider about the temperature variation in space, the dew point uh, uncertainty is quite low. So you can, if you want to study the boundary layer process, you can invert that to the dew point temperature as the plot. Also, the, we, before we show the case variation, and now people will use that for the model evaluation. And this work is also done in NCAR by uh, Fei Chen. So the refractivity field, the evolution we showed before, has been used for evaluate the um, high resolution lens surface uh, system. So this is the uh, evaporation uh, rate in the day. So it shows consistent. So it would be one of the use for the model evaluation. And nowadays, people in model, model will use the radar model. Some people use the radar refractivity uh, in the model evaluation in the um, precipitation to compare the refractivity of the radar and the model in more high resolution part to see how was the uh, model environment changes. And they got a really interesting result because for the high res resolution model, the difference will become large. So it also suggests that the model in the high resolution probably cannot simulate the refractivity in the very uh, detailed or accurate way. And the early work on the using the refractivity for data simulation is mainly done by Tim Bomomel and McGill in the very early days in 2002. So they assimilated refractivity and they found the result they can adjust the low level moisture and get a better uh, QPF and better distribution of the moisture. For example, this is a forecast error of the reflectivity, which is the precipitation, precipitation echo in time. And the, 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 the solid line is the control run and the dash line is the now cast, now cast result comes from the um, extrapolation. And here the dash line shows the uh, assimilation. So the assimilation seems help for the, a little bit for the forecast. And also in NCAR, um, Dr. Sun, and he, she also do some like, work on the, using the IHOP and found that that shows some promising result in the collection and the QPF forecasting. This is the, in OU, people wants to use that for initial condition, uh, convection initiations. And then they found also if you can detect the, assimilate the refractivity, it will improve the convection initiation. And recently in Japan, they also want to do some like storm forecasting things. And furthermore, we, we know the refractivity is from the case analysis gradually move to the model simulation. And here is the radar network. Many is proposed for the from the research mode to the operational mode. So because we know the radar cover the refractivity coverage is quite small. So in the early days they also want to expand the coverage of radar refractivity to hundreds kilometers. So in the refract experiment, the three late radars has been um, combined to obtain a larger uh, coverage of refractivity. So Chio and Espo and the K. FTG radar are combined. And this is in 2006. Nowadays in Metal France and in UK, Met Office, they already have some like, radar be becomes operational. So therefore we know the evolutions now from 1997 is from the research mode to the more operational mode, prepare for the more operational mode. So before we use a lot of, we use this data, we need to know the refractivity quality. So many works has been done to compare with other uh, other observations. For example, this is the during the IHOP experiment, the ESPO radar refractivity compared with the surface stations. So ESPO is in more the solid line. So in time, it shows very consistent variations. So the result seems more uh, promising, and this is compared with the airy uh, profiles. So the thick line is the refractivity, and the dashed line will shows the uh, refractivity at different levels near surface. So we know in the in the um, in the daytime there are more mixing things happen. So the boundary layer is mixed very well. So there are not very different 
they are not very uh, different in the refractivity in the height. So the refractivity can pro, uh, present more the refractivity at a 200 meters height. However, at night when the mixing is not as um, strong as the daytime, the, the refractivity becomes more uh, stratified because the temperature uh, inversion or the water vapor uh, gradients becomes large. So you will see more uh, difference in the vertical. But that is more like a representativeness. How would you use this in the different levels? So, but there are still some problems that are not solved. For example, <laughs> even it's very consistent, but at, a sign, at some time period, you will see a little bit of discrepancies here from the surface and the, the radar estimated. And especially this was occurred in the nighttime. So in order to do so, um, many error sources of refractivity has been qualitatively at, uh, analyzed. And the second part, especially for the people who want to do that in the operational center, uh, operational mode, for example, in UK and in France, they need to solve more like hardware problems like transmitter frequency drifting, but this has been already solved. So there's still some missing part, and this will become my uh, PhD uh, thesis, is the, the, the occasionally the refractivity biases, particularly at night. So now we are going to the technical parts. Uh, we know the refractivity is estimated from the phase measurements. But the phase measurement is really, really noisy. And how do you get extract the inf useful information from this noisy field to the useful information? It really requires a lot of sophisticated data processing procedures. But we know the quality of the phase definitely will affects the refractivity changes. And here I will show you how does it affect the uh, refractivity uh, estimations. For example, this is the phase differences, and we caught a radio uh, in a radio way. So this is a reflect uh, the phase measurements at various at different uh, distance from the radar. The green one is the real measurement, so you can see it goes up and down. It's very noisy, and the red one shows um, the more strong targets, which means it has more better quality. But even so, it's not easy to estimate that. So we need to do some smoothing to make it uh, as the easy to estimate. And this one case is OK. But for some time in the night, you will see the phase, even after the smooth, is very difficult to estimate the radio change of the phase differences. So we need to tackle this problem. And the question we ask is more the fundamental ones. What caused the noisy phase differences? And can we estimate these phase differences and its impact on the quality of the reflectivity? So let's go back to the very uh, simple concepts. This is the radar. This is the targets. This is a very simple idea like Fred. Fat, Dr. Fabric came out in 1997. The phase measurement will only depends on the refractivity change along the path and also the, the R, which is known as the, the fixed distance. However, we know when we look on, outside the window, we know the targets are not at the same height of the radar. Targets are on the terrain and with different height. So when there are some height differences, we need to consider the vertical variation of the refractivity. And here after, I will call it as the DNDH. And this DNDH really plays an important role in the uh, phase quality, because the DNDH will affect the average refractivity that's the, along the beam path, as well as the path range. Because the radar beam, the propagation of radar beam is um, very sensitive to the uh, DNDH variations due to the snail's, snail's law. So for example, the dashed line here is when the DNDH is minus 157 per kilometer.
kilometer, which means that very uh, in the inversion uh, conducting uh, thing. So all the beam will bend down to the ground. And for the most time, the, reflect, the, the NDH is usually greater than this value. So you will see the, uh, the beam path is a little bit curved, then the path range changes. So in fact, what we measure the phase difference is not only the horizontal variation, but also the vertical and the path changes. So it's a very complicated to interpret this phase. Furthermore, we want to simulate how noisy will this become and what problem it might cause. So this one is the, uh, because we know the, everything starts with the height differences. So the green line and the, so the green line and the blue line here are shows the height of the targets in uh, distance away from the radar. And the red one is the topography changes. And we also mimic the height of the ground target, which is randomly distributed on the ground targets. Then we use this um, uh, phase equations to do more uh, sophisticated calculations. And we got the phase variation along uh, the distance when the horizontal reflectivity only changed one end unit. So this is the ideal cases everything is on the same height. You will see the phase changes gradually in a smooth way and easily to be estimated. And the blue line shows even the targets and the radar are at the same height, same height. but as the NDH changes, you will have the biases divert, start to um, divert it from the green line. Moreover, you can see even on the, on the terrain, there are also some like noisiness, but the most key problem is the, the gradient changes. So you will get wrong, a, a bias of the reflective estimation. And no, not to mention the uh, ground targets, you will see more uh, fluctuations here. So how much does it changes? We can sort of qu um, quantify it. For example, if today the ground targets uh, target one, target two are um, one kilometer in distance depart apart, and the height difference is 10 meter. Then we will have the local refractivity bias. Uh, it, it's a function of the distance of the target one and also the vertical gradient changes. For example, if the ground target is at 30 kilometers away and the DNT changes, it's uh, 100 per kilometer, you will have 15 end unit changes. But how much, how big is this changes? When we, so we recall that in previous, like one end unit change could cause by the one sales degree. So 15 end units will cause by 15 sales degree. So this is a, a bias you, we need to deal with instead of to make that, that. Then how do we correct that? Uh, I won't explain those things too much detail, but the more easy way or concept to get that is, what do we want? We want the refractivity is easy to use at the given height above the terrain. So it's the, for example, like the blue line here. So basically the refractivity, local refractivity is estimated from the uh, radial gradient of the phase difference between these two targets. And we can derive this one is our goal, is the refractivity change at a given height. And the other part is also be measured and will be as the bias is estimated in the current method. So this bias will needs to be removed. And this bias is also associated with the vertical variation of refractivity. And more detailed work is in here. But the problem is how, if we want to solve the, the bias, bias, we need to know the DNDH, but we don't measure the DNDH. Therefore, we came out an, another method to estimate the DNDH. Before, we used the face of the measurements. Now, we are going to use the power of the measurement. Uh, for most of radar meteorologists, we know the DNDH as the propagation condition will affect the beam propagation. For example, in the, in the daytime, when the mix is well, the vertical 
gradient of the DNDA is just close to zero, but in the nighttime, when the air, when the atmospheric becomes more stratified, the DNDH will become more negative. And the, the beam also change with this DNDH. So here you can arrive the targets within this the elevation, but in the nighttime, the, the beam will be ducked to the ground. So you will have some uh, patterns on the reflectivity coverage of the lowest elevations. So you will have larger coverage in the nighttime than in the daytime. But this is more the qualitatively describe the DNDH variations by knowing the coverage of the refractivity. So for quantitative use, how do we estimate that? So we came out another, uh, the same, yeah, this is the same um, methodology, but we use the radar to scan also the point-like target as what we mentioned, the ground targets before. So the power, uh, the return power of this ground targets is also uh, varies with uh, different antenna elevation scans. And it can be described as the radar antenna beam pattern, which is a uh, nearly the Gaussian distributions. And we found that at night and and in the daytime, the, the distribution will shift. So by um, deriving some mathematical equations, we can linearly link the power variations and the DNDH changes. So by estimate, by measuring the reflect, reflectivity Z field, we will get the DNDH field. So we use the NCAR ASPO radar to estimate the DNDH and compare with the uh, BAO tower. And the BAO tower is here, and this is the target we selected for estimating the DNDH. This is the result. The, uh, we did three days experiments, and the, this is the DNDH variation in three days. The r red one is the BL tower, and the blue one is the radar estimation. So you can see clear the diurnal cycle. In the daytime, the refractivity is higher due to the well mix, and in nighttime, you will see large some um, uh, differences here. But overall, it's very consistent. And we came out with some uh, reasons to explain why there's some uh, consistency. The first is probably the height representativeness is different. Because your ground targets are more close to the ground compared with a tower, we need to know the ground targets, for example, like a power tower could be like 10 meter or 20 meters height above the terrain. So what we measure is really close to the ground, it's 10 or 20 meters. But the BL tower is measured from the one to a hundred meter high. So, and we know more closer to the ground, the refractivity will change much more than the above. So probably this is caused by this, the, the height representativeness problem. And the third part, a second part, is probably caused by the elevation um, pointing biases. So if we correct the uh, antenna elevations for a point, 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 point three degree, then we can a little bit shift and it will match better in the, in the daytime. Therefore, by estimating the DNDH will help us to correcting the refractivity uh, biases. So we know that this is uh, refractivity measurements really quite related to the phase difference. And what we present in the previous section is from a very ideal ground target, which means the tempor temporal change of the phase is um, purely related to the refractivity, as can be um, described with these uh, equations. However, when you look out the window again, you found that there are not always the ground targets. There are other things like trees or some complex ground targets. And this term will cause another error terms. For example, if the target like trees, it moves, it will cause the range changes. So if the range changes, your face will changes. And this doesn't represent any refractivity related, but we cannot uh, quantify them. So we'll call this as an error term. And other uh, possibilities probably comes from the 
complexity of the ground target. If the ground target is more complicated, the, then the phase interference will be, become more difficult to um, explain. So this effect of the ground target itself will include in the error terms. So, but because it's more too much technical work, so I will just um, highlight some important parts and more detail can see these two papers. So, but we don't know how much is the error of the phases. So we came up another method to estimate the quality of the ground target based on the phase characters itself. So this is a new um, ground target uh, reliability index. The, the white one is the gr good ground targets and the black one is the bad ground targets, which means the white one will be more represent refractivity changes in contrast with the, the, this, the bad one, which probably caused by the wind or something else. So this will be the new refractivity uh, index changes. And then we can, we also do some simulation to get the phase fluctuations based on this uh, ground target uh, reliability. And then we will get the refractivity error map based on these uncertainties. The result shows that in some areas, for example, like the uh, urban or in this good, uh, uh, better covered of the ground target area, we will have less uh, errors on the refractivity. And the magnitude is within uh, one n unit, so it's more uh, neg negligible. However, on other sides, if we, are, we don't have too much ground targets, then we will have a lot of uh, errors, and that's more like randomly distributed. So this will give us a more idea about how do we interpret the refractive field and how much the reliability of the refractivity field based on the measurement we have. So, summary of the progress. The goal of, for further uh, applications we want is the more representativeness of the refractivity. That means we want the refractivity at a given height of the, above the terrain. By doing so, we need to first to uh, correct the refractive biases. And we did that by estimating the DNDH using the new method. And we also estimating the refractive errors. So this will build up a step for further, uh, so this is quantitative improvements, um, such as the data simulations, because you, know, you need to know the data quality, how good is the data, and give them different weighting. Or the radar network implementations, because the problem of the radar network implementation is the radar are at different heights, so you need to adjust that height problems or to synergy with other uh, boundary layer instruments. Especially the radar refractivity is like few, meet, few tens meters above the ground, and that's not most, uh, even the boundary layer instruments have, such as the uh, water vapor dial radar. So we know the refractivity histories from 1997 to now. We are from the more the uh, case study to the uh, quantitative application, and also from starting from the research mode gradually to the operational mode. And we already make some progresses for the data interpretation and the data quality control, also the the error estimations. So this will helps to for further application. And in the third part, what I'm going to present is more what I think is probably, it's very like a preliminary idea. It's not very already uh, a firm result, but it, it will provide some imaginations on what we can use the refractivity for the future. Um, before we think that, we need to think about the what the radar um, community think. Uh, Blue Einstein say, uh, have the statements in the uh, future needs of a, uh, operational radar. He may, they mentioned that refractivity could be uh, uh, operational in the WSR-88D because it provides the 
temperature and moisture fields that has a high temporal and uh, spatial resolutions. And it's very important for the mesoscale meteorology. So we think about the map of the uh, WSR 88D. And the previous work has been quite done well in the uh, Great Plains area. And this, in this area, all the refractivity has been used for the convection initiations associated with some boundaries, like the outflow boundaries or the dry lines. And it, it could provide you high resolution uh, temporal and spatial changes. And also some boundary layer process. But when you look at the figure, what else kind, what kind of uh, thermal dynamic boundary will you think? Probably you came out much more. For example, um, we will have a um, lack effect because the, there's a contrast between the the water and the, the the land. Also, some convection initiations along the coast because of the diurnal uh, lengthy breezes. So refractivity can also provide you the high resolution. Uh, temporal and spatial resolution that's probably not many observation can have because what we have is depends on the mesonet for the near surface um, station. Or because here before we are more focused on the storm initiation, but seldom people look into the storm evolutions. We know we, even within the storm, there are several uh, detailed structure near surface occurred. So here I will show you some cases. That is not in that is not in U.S., but it's also the NCAR um, uh, project in the in SOMAX and TIMREX experiments occurring in Taiwan. And this is the it will shows you different in the different environments how was refractivity changes to show the environment of the store. For example, uh, this is the ESPO located. And this is the southern part of Taiwan. This is the sea, the oceans, and this is the mountain. We only get very limited refractivity coverage, which is 20 or 225 kilometers in radius. But in this, even in these small regions, it's uh, with highly um, populated people live there. So it's also important to know what's going on here for the therm near surface thermodynamic variations. So this case will be in a, an IOP cases, so there are a lot of convection moves in. So we will show this one is the reflectivity pattern we usually see, the return from the hydrometers. And this is a refractivity field shows the low level uh, thermodynamic contrast. At one, local, 1 p.m. local time, you can see there is more like homogeneous refractivity Field because it's the end of some like big system already passed by, so the environment becomes more um, homogeneous. So this is the value of that. And we see there is some uh, still comes from the south part. There is some convection continue moving. So, but it's very interesting because even the when the con convection moves in, the refractivity drops because before we expect the refractivity after the convection will increase, it's because of the moisture or something. But very, too, very surprised at the refractivity patterns start to change in this uh, direction. And when there's a new, some new um, convection continue moving and it dies out. At the same time, this is after 45 minutes, there's another new uh, thermodynamic uh, gradient occurs on here. We don't, I don't know why, but it just shows as a very, um, in a very tiny variable uh, thermodynamic contrast. And also the high refractivity boundary continues moving. And it set up a stage when this new convection mo moves in and it becomes more severe. So the refractivity field really shows high temporal and spatial resolution about how the low level thermodynamic con condition changes. And this will not be observed from the reflectivity. Probably is from, you can get the information from the surface stations, but it will provide you something, the data we didn't think before. 
So we show some the thermodynamic conditions prior to the convection initiations in grad plants or the related to the evolution in the stomach data. And this could be uh, helpful for the um, data simulation system nowadays because current um, NWP model is more in a high horizontal resolution and with rapid uh, uh, data simulation cycling. And in 2015, WMO also mentioned that um, the refractivity is in more the research mode and if it needs to become the operational mode, there are needs more studies to be devoted to explain and use the refractivity for the NWP or the short-term forecasting model. So because the refractivity is not the easy, very it is sort of easy, but it's not direct as the, temp the surface measurement. So what is in really the intelligence way to simulate this um, high resolution and high temporal, but with a very limited coverage data for STORM and the QPF, it is still an open question. And how much will the refractivity um, modify the initial condition of this, uh, the model or the following forecasting? There's still also an open uh, questions need to be known. When we talk about the thermal contrast, there's another kind of thermal contrast which has occurred during the urban and rural. For example, um, here is also in the Montreal area, and this is Montreal Island is more the urban like uh, things. And the figure I show here is more the climatology. Uh, soil moisture. So in the urban area, you will see lower soil moisture because the the buildings cover all the, the land. In the rural side, you will have a higher soil moisture. So you can see there's also the moisture gradient between these two areas. So we do uh, three days refractivity average to when we found there are some similar patterns in the in the refractivity also consists with the soil moisture, which means you have more, for the urban part, you will usually have the dry and warm air here, so you will have lower refractivity. And in the rural part, you usually have the wet and more evaporation, uh, more evaporation and a more cool air, so you will have a higher refractivity. So this will also provide you some um, thermodynamic uh, contrast between the thing. So besides the storm in the boundary layer, probably this one can also provide you, especially the diurnal cycle, because the diurnal cycle of these two lens surface contrasts is still a question. People usually use the flux to answer this, but this will give you more the 2D variations, so you probably have more ideas about how it evolves in space, 2D space. So Refractivity can also be used on the land surface and the atmospheric interaction, especially on the heterogeneous uh, distribution of the land. And probably the refractivity could be a new urban heat island index because it presents the, the quality of the air in the same way people expect the urban heat island. So the last part is refractivity has been used widely for the storm scale because it provides you high temporal and spatial resolutions. So you can um, you can estimate, you can understand what the near surface low level thermal condition goes on related to the storm. But now if we consider about the operational uh, radar mode, we we'll probably will have more radars. And the thing we want to know how much the refractivity could help the NWP, not only in the storm, but also in the regional model. So after average refractivity over this limited areas, for example, 30 kilometers radius, the representatives of the ref average refractivity probably will be better than the point observations because it contains more variability in the area. Based on this idea, we, were, we, we are thinking, uh, how could this uh, information be propagated in the regional model? 
By doing so, we try to examine the um, horizontal background error covariances of refractive field in the lowest model level. So, and the data is from the uh, Environment Canada regional model with 15 kilometers resolutions and the forecast height 12 hour. And this is a very limited uh, ensemble, only 20, but it still can show you some uh, variation. And this is a monthly correlations between the uh, radar refractivity and the other grid refractivity. And that the correlation length is about tw uh, three kilometers away. So which means the refractivity measure in the Montreal McGill radar, it could be propagated to the 30 kilometers away. It will affect the uh, if you assimilate data, this could be this observation information could be propagated, and this is more the auto um, the cross correlation between the refractivity and the specific humidity. It shows a very similar pattern as the refractivity here, and this is the cross correlation between the radar and the temperature. But in this part, you won't see uh, the good correlations that. So consider about that, we consider about all the, um, the, the radar network part. We will see different contributions from that, contribution from refractivity to the regional model. So it pre gives us a brief ideas about is that work or not, but there are more work that need to be done to verify all the impacts. So the summary, we talk about the refractivity from the observations part uh, to, to the case analysis to the NWP and then from the research mode to the operational. And we need to we make sure more about the data quality and the, this is the, the future application, but the future application still requires more studies and more idea, new ideas. So, okay, that's fine. Thank you very much, Ya Chen. Are there any other any questions for our speaker? Now I know if you ever, uh, you know, had some theoretical beam patterns made for you, you know, the antenna, the beam. Uh, you either can do that via modeling, or else I guess you could measure them. Also, you'll notice that the phase going across it is pretty constant across the main power beam, yeah. but then they can kind of droop off. Uh -huh. So in other words, if you're looking at a very large target that has 70 dBZ reflectivity, you know, even though your side lobes are going to be down, you know, maybe like 25 dB or something mm -hmm. like that. You'll still get a very, very large signal, but the phase change will be much. The diff the, the, that phase is going to be perhaps different there. Did you does that? Did you look into that or think about that? Or maybe this is not even an issue. I don't know. Yeah, that's more related to my second second part of how do we how do we uh, how do we uh, determine it's a good target based on the 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 ground the face something like what you mentioned is that this is a power antenna power pattern and this is a phase pattern so if the so this is good for the point targets which means we can easily to determine the the phase phase variations but from for the complex targets the very large targets this one could, the, the, the pattern could be changed. I don't have. For, for example, this is for the good small targets. And this is from probably from more buildings located or something more complicated. So now you cannot see the, the face variation. Is that your questions about the face? Well, I'm, uh, that speaks to it, but I wanted to. Yeah, yes, that speaks to it, but can you correct for that, or does that affect your your refractivity measurements? You mean and, phase pattern? Yeah, the phase yeah. pattern of the rate uh, of that. So, and yeah. is is it correctable? So it does. The, you're saying it does affect it. Yes. Yes. And then what do you do mm -hmm. about it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So because we those we also did some like um, different 
more uh, special scans. So we will have good ideas about how the phase variation of that. And this indeed affects the refractive estimations because now we try to use two elevations. So if you want to use two elevations, if the targets is at, in the center of the beam, then you won't have the problem. Right. But if that at age of the beam, you will have the changes a lot, right? So by doing, we also, that's why I say we came out another new method to do a new parameterization it's based on the phase correlations between the two phase. Uh, phase at two elevations. So if in the time the phase variations is constant, which means the targets always will be in, in the same, the main beam. But if the targets at the age of the main beam, you will probably have lower correlation in time. So that's just more the quantitatively to use that part for the, to identify that. So we will sort of move out that bad targets. Um, you, you talked about vertical gradients in refractivity. Are there not also horizontal gradients? And do you have to take those into account in some way? Um, horizontal is what we want to see. The horizontal refractivity is what we want to see. The but they may be changing. Yes, but that's our signal. So, okay, okay. <laughs> so our goal, our goal is to measuring the, uh, the horizontal refractivity variation for well, I, I'm, I'm imagining maybe your, your target appears to be in different places. Yes. Depending on. Depends on the. Are you talking in azimuth when you're talking in range by any chance? The refractivity? I'm talking in azimuth, yeah. She's talking azimuth, but I think you're thinking in range. Okay. The horror, oh, you mean? Yeah, that will be one of the problems. But I think that is more, it's not very significant as the DMDH in azimuth changes. Fascinating stuff. Um, one of the questions I have, um, I've always thought of this as kind of a fair weather thing. You know, you can mm -hmm. see urban heat islands, heterogeneity in the, mm -hmm. the moisture field, but you showed something from Timrex where you actually had varying refractivity when you were had precipitation around. Mm. How, how much are you restricted? Um, how much rain do you have to have before you can't do that anymore? How much? Rainfall. I mean, was there, oh, were the you, rainfall. was that all clear skies or was there some rain in the air when you were taking those measurements? Even in the rain, you can still estimate refractivity. There will be a little bit bias, but it can be estimated depending on your rainfall rate. So for example, if the rainfall rate is 30 millimeter per hour, the refractivity bias will be one in units. So if it's, in, so it will increase with the rainfall rate, mm. but you can sort of quantify that errors, a uh, bias. Mm. So this increases its utility for storm forecasting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Chen, you described how the DMDH profile mm. uh, affects the measurements in the daytime and at night. Yeah. Um, and then you showed a couple of pictures of how the DMDH changes cause anomalous propagation, mm -hmm. AP. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to use AP as, you know, quantitatively so that you could maybe estimate DMDH, especially at night, and come up with a better error estimate caused by the DMDH profile? Um, I think we... We use another way to estimate the DNDH. We use a point like targets, like I, like I describe yeah. here. But you could also use yeah, the use anomalous the propagation field to do yeah, something I, similar. Um, Shinju, 
she tries to do that using the AP, the coverage of the reflectivity, and they do the, some simulations to see how, how the coverage will vary with the time, with some assumptions. So they already did that. Uh, could you comment on the face nice requirements for the radar, for this uh, technique? Face? Face nice requirement. How accurate the face nice of the radar? Any limit? Face accuracy. How dumb. Okay, so I say we did the phase correlations between two elevations, and we assume that in this two um, time series of the elevation, the phase ele elevations, the ver the variability or the the phase is the same. So we can sort of calculate the. So this will be the phase correlations, what we can get, and we can invert that to the. Uh, variance of the phase fluctuation, like the noise, noise value. So, for example, if the correlation is one, we can sort of estimate the the phase is zero. But when it goes 0.4, we can say the error of the phase is around the standard deviation of the phase is around 60 degree. And this is done by more the simulation. So. That's how much the errors of the noisy faces. I'm thinking about the radar itself, radar phase, the transmit phase. Uh -huh. How much, how accurate it should be, the phase error in the radar hardware. How, how stable the phase should be. I think how stable. I'm not sure how stable. Once you know your local oscillator well, and you can know the phase, because it depends on the frequency of the transmitter, right? The the noise of the the phase. So once you get the frequency of local local oscillator and the transmitter, you know the value, then you will see how it varies. And that's, I think, probably is what also the people using the Clastron and the Mectron differences. For the Clastron, we don't have this problem. But for the Mectron, because the frequency fluctuates a lot, then it's not easy. So what they did is they tried to, as, to uh, observe the local frequency, and that they can know how much the, phase, the frequency drift, and they, so they can correct that bias. Thank you. So the UK has um, refractivity that's operational on their mm -hmm. network radars. Mm -hmm. Any other countries? France. France does as well. Uh -huh. What about Canada? Any interest there? Fred will do that. <laughs> OK. So it's coming. It'll probably happen in Canada before the US. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you showed that, and I just didn't see it. But so there was there was some baseline for this refractivity measurement using the McGill radar, mm -hmm. and then Ya Chen came along and did all this research and improved it. Is there? Did you ever make a, a determine the degree of improvement to their refractivity measurement, or was that measurable even? You mean the? There, I mean before you before you started correcting. For, yes. this, for this, this DNDH, mm -hmm. there were people, we made refractivity measures not knowing for that in IHOP. Mm -hmm. now, now you do corrections for that. Can you quantify what that improvement is? Is there, is there, is there yes. a degree Co of uncertainty? Mm -hmm. or? I think you mean that for the DNDH mm -hmm. uncertainty to that, the error, I think it's not too, too, too much. It's, I think it's within 5N units. Mm -hmm. So, I mean the uncertainty of the DNDH impact on the bias estimation is within about five N units. So I think compared with the fifteen, it's it's getting better. We are we are not to say we are doing 
we solve all the problem, but we are getting there. So the, the, so the improvement that you're going to see is probably maybe more visual. You'll see a smoother retractivity field or something yes. like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was curious if there was there a way to quantify that improvement. Yes. The metric that you're using. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays what we can most use is also from the simulation. Because for and for any like comparison with the service station, you also need to consider about that. But for the method itself, it, this one is the the big problem for the DNDH. So theoretically, it should be removed out that. So usually you will see some like wavy pattern in, on the refractivity field. And that could be caused by this effect. Okay, Ya Chen will be here with us one more full day. So if anyone would like to talk with her, she'd be happy to get your input and ideas and suggestions. Um, but that's all. So let's thank Ya Chen again. Thanks. Thank you.